Hi folks, thanks for indulging me and spending a little bit of time today. I have a question for you. Why was Jesus baptized? Well, this is a question that's not easy to answer. Um, and uh, it's hard to give a clear and convincing answer. So let's let's start on this subject and see what God's Word has to say about it. And may you be blessed by it and learn more about the mind of Christ. The issue is generally negatively viewed. And one thing is certain. Jesus was not baptized by John in the vein of the prophet's ordinary sphere of operation. John immersed folks who penitently confessed their sins. Matthew 3, verse 6 and 8. And the purpose of this baptism was for the remission of sins. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. The preposition for ice in Greek means to obtain. The phrase may be rendered so that sins might be forgiven. And since Jesus had no sin, Hebrews 4.15 and 1 Peter 2.22, it is obvious that his immersion by John was of a unique sort. He did not approach John seeking pardon. Many years ago, this writer was in debate with a denominationalist during which we discussed the design of baptism. The opponent argued in this fashion. We are immersed for the same reason Jesus was. He was not baptized in order to become a son of God, but rather because of being a son already. Hence, we are not immersed to become children of God, but because we are such already. Well, his argument was invalid for several reasons. First, it contradicted the plain testimony of Paul, who declared that we become children of God at the point of our baptism into Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27. Second, the argument was inconsistent with the gentleman's own doctrinal position. Let's think about this. If it is the case that we are baptized for precisely the same reason Christ was, then it also follows that he was immersed for the same reason that we are. Things equal to each other we are equal to the same thing. Since the opponent claimed that he had been baptized on account of the forgiveness of his sins, that would logically imply that Jesus was immersed on account of the forgiveness of his sins. This, of course, was a conclusion which my friend would not accept. It was, however, the logical result of his argument. Thus, except for the fact that Jesus' baptism reflected a willingness to obey the Father, as does ours, there is little relationship between the Lord's immersion and that required of all accountable people today. And we can reference Mark chapter 16, verse 16 on this. In the balance of this article, I would like to set forth three reasons for the baptism of Jesus by John. First, it was to identify the Lord as the Son of God at the beginning of his ministry. Second, it was a commencement token of the total dedication of Christ in carrying out heaven's plan. And third, it was a visual precursor to the Savior's ultimate death, burial, and resurrection. Well, each of these three items needs a little bit more development. This is the Son of God. John the Baptizer was a remarkable character. Isaiah prophetically described him as a voice crying in the wilderness preparing the way of the Lord, as referenced in Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 3. The Old Testament closes with the promise of the coming Elijah, Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. 
in allusion to John, whose mission in the spirit and power of Elijah was to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 17. John announced Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. The expression, Lamb of God, reveals that Jesus was the antitype, or the fulfillment, of the Old Testament sacrificial system. It argues for the atoning nature of the Lord's death and, potentially, the universal accept accessibility of that blessing. John declared that it was his mission to prepare the way for Christ, who was to come after him, i.e. John's work would precede the Lord's. Chapter 1, verse 30. But John declared, He is before me, i.e. Christ, due to his divine nature, was to take precedence over the Baptist, because, as John says, he was before me. The imperfect tense verb, in, or was, asserts the abiding existence of Jesus before John was born. John 1.1 1, 1. But the baptizer continued. He says, I knew him not, but that he should be manifest to Israel. For this cause came I, baptizing in water. Verse 31. The verb, knew, K-N-E-W, is very significant. It derives from oida, which suggests a clear, more or less complete knowledge. The pluperfect tense form casts the situation into the past. John is confessing that, prior to the phenomenal events at the Jordan River, he did not know in an absolute way, that Jesus was the Messiah. John knew that the Nazarene was an exceptional person, for he resisted immersing the Lord, insisting, I have need to be baptized by you. And you can see this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. He did not have, however, a clear understanding of the Savior's true identity until he saw the Spirit descend in the form of a dove and he heard the divine voice break the silence of 15 centuries in that acknowledgement. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, verse 17. After this occurred, the baptizer could testify, This is the Son of God. John 1, 34. Accordingly, one of the reasons for Jesus' baptism was to confirm the Lord's identity to the prophet, so that John could make manifest to Israel, John 1.31, the good news that the Messiah had arrived. An Example of Obedience In his argument to persuade John to administer baptism, Christ said, Thus it becomes proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew 3.15 Perhaps we cannot plumb the full depth of this abbreviated clause. One thing is certain, though. It is an affirmation of the submissive disposition of the Lord Jesus to the Father's will. Righteousness is associated with the commands of God, as referenced in Psalm 119, verse 172. To fulfill righteousness, therefore, is to be obedient to Jehovah. The life of Jesus is commentary on what obedience is all about. In the 40th Psalm, which is clearly messianic in its import, cross-referenced with Hebrews 10, verse 5 and 7, the submissive demeanor of Christ is prophetically set forth. Jesus, through David, a thousand years before his own birth, affirms, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is in my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. It is one thing 
to begrudgingly go through a form of service, it is quite another to delight in doing the Father's will. Again, while some may have the elements of divine law in their heads, the issue is, do we have, as did Jesus, the law in our hearts? Christ demonstrated by his baptism, therefore, on the very first day of his public ministry, that he was committed to doing his Father's will. In this regard, as in all others, he is our perfect model. Next we have a preview of Gospel Facts. In his first epistle to the Corinthians, Apostle Paul set forth the fundamental components of the Gospel. And he said, Now I make known unto you, brethren, the Gospel, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he hath been raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The death of Jesus as the key ingredient in the plan of redemption was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, verse 19. Christ himself, though developed as a normal human being, including the expansion of mental consciences. Luke 2, verse 52. One cannot but wonder at what point in his mental and physical maturation the blessed Savior became aware of his ultimate destiny at Calvary. We know that by the age of 12, Jesus was cognizant of his unique status as a son of God. And you can reference Luke chapter 2, verse 49. From the time of his infancy, Mary was privy to the dark shadows that loomed in her son's future. Reference Luke chapter 2, verse 35. One thing seems clear. By the time he had submitted to immersion at the hands of John, he knew of his appointment with the cross, and likely long before that. At this point, it is imperative that we give some attention to the form of baptism. Those who argue that baptism may be administered either by the sprinkling or pouring of water fly directly in the face of linguistic evidence, New Testament usage, and the testimony of early Christian history. First, the verb baptizo means to dip or immerse. Even the translators so understood its meaning in non-theological contexts where their bias did not overpower them. Reference Luke 16.24 and John 13.26. Second, baptism is clearly identified with a burial. Romans 6.3-4 and Colossians 2.12. And third, sprinkling was first introduced in the 3rd century A.D. Eusebius Cebius the sixth, and the innovation did not become the official practice of the apostate Roman Church until A.D. 1311, when the Council of Ravenna first allowed a choice between immersion and sprinkling. So clearly, then, the baptism of Jesus in the waters of the Jordan River involved a burial beneath the water, and the resurrection therefrom. Mark specifically states that Jesus was baptized of John in the Jordan. And afterward, the Lord came up out of the water. Mark 1, verse 9 through 10. Even Professor Blunt, noted scholar of the Church of England, conceded that it is beyond doubt that Jesus was immersed. So why is it that so many have such a difficult time and understanding the form of baptism? It is so vital to the entire format of the divine plan of salvation. Christ's burial in the water of the Jordan and his resurrection therefrom 
was a visual preview of the burial, which implies a death, of course, and resurrection of the Lord, which would occur three and one-half years later. We agree with Carson, who suggested that the Lord's role as Jehovah's suffering servant here makes its first veiled appearance in Jesus' actions. It is commonly suggested by commentators that Christ was baptized in order to solidify himself with sinners, since he, by his death, would bear away the penalty for sin. That may be the case, but the Bible does not specifically argue that point. So in conclusion, we may not understand all the reasons why Christ submitted to baptism. We have a limited view of that wonderful event. We should, however, note this. If the sinless Son of God did not refuse His divine ordinance, how much less should men today neglect the command, which is declared to be for the remission of sins? Acts 2, verse 38. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this has helped you understand a little bit more about the mind of God and His plan of salvation and why Jesus was baptized. Thank you very much, and God bless.